Thank you very much. Uh, you may think this is a long way to give a lecture, but I have travelled twice to North America. I have travelled to the deserts of West Australia. I have travelled to Indonesia. Now I come to Korea. So this is a great excitement to me to be here. So POSTEC is very well known to still researchers around the world and so this is exciting. First of all, I'd like to apologise for my accent. But I would like to teach you how to talk, to talk Australian. Now, I'll give you a lesson. If the English will say the gate, that's how the English would say gate. But Australians get the vowel and make it very long and flat. So now you say, gate. <laughs> All right, everybody together. Gate. Yeah, you talk Australian. <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> so that's the secret to talking Australian. All right, so I'm today delivering a lecture about steelmaking. Um, steelmaking, I, maybe this is the wrong city to say this, but steelmaking is so incredibly successful technology that you can take it for granted. But I want to explain to you how we've got to this amazing developments in steelmaking and then what we're doing to understand better how steelmaking works. And as it said, we're honouring John Elliott. So we should talk a little bit about John Elliott. So John Elliott, um, he was at a period of time when steelmaking was becoming more scientific. And US Steel put a lot of money into trying to get on top of the science, particularly the thermodynamics. And uh, Professor Gann, he's crazy about thermodynamics, as you know. Well, the, he's, his forebear is this man, because this man was really crazy about thermodynamics. And he said, if you want to understand steelmaking, you need to understand the thermodynamics. And he did a lot of very clever work. Actually, this paper is his most famous paper. And this paper gives you a very simple, elegant mathematical treatment of, uh, of boy behaviour and then gives you a lot of data to be able to do useful calculations. So we should all aspire to such things. Something that is elegant but also useful. That is something we can all aspire to. I wish, I, I wish all my work uh, was elegant and useful. So Elliot was a great uh, researcher. I, I d didn't know the gentleman, but I believe he was also a great teacher. So uh, I'm very, of course, uh, honoured to have this award. What are we talking about? Well, um, we're talking about this amazing process. So uh, I think if you've walked on a steel plant, uh, you realise that oxygen steel making is very exciting. Now I wish to ask a question. Is anybody in here in love with iron making in the room? Any iron making people? Oh good, I won't insult anybody. What I was going to say is that steel making is incredibly exciting. Iron making, well, I'm not sure it's as exciting. <laughs> and maybe rolling has some excitement, but I, I claim that steel making is the most exciting part. And when you go there, uh, when you're at school, they talk about exothermic reactions. But you don't know the meaning of exothermic until you stand next to an st uh, oxygen steel process. Then you understand the word because you can feel the heat. The heat is amazing. And this heat is being released by incredible reactions, oxidation reactions of carbon, silicon, manganese and phosphorus. And this heat is so extraordinary that we have to add scrap to keep the process cool. When you look at a process like that, I'd like you to imagine what it was like the first time that somebody made this process work. Can you imagine how difficult it was and partly we're going to try and understand that today. First of all, I want you to think about the steel industry. Uh, you are at the moment in one of the great centres of the world's steel industry. But I want you to think about the extraordinary size of it. There are 1,490 million tonnes made in 2011. Actually, those numbers are a bit rubbery because in China it's very difficult to know exactly what steel the Chinese are making. But 1,490. And look at it compared to the other metals. 40 million tonnes of aluminium, ten, less than 1 million tonne of, mag of magnesium. That's extraordinary. So in other words, every other metal is completely dwarfed by steel. Now, that gives you some motivations. 
Say, for example, you care about the environment. Say you love the environment and you want to improve the environment. Well, a 1% improvement in the steel industry is like an 80% improvement in aluminium. If you want to make a difference to the world, steel is a fantastic place to make a difference because of the scale of it, which excites me. The other thing also is to look at the breakdown of countries who make steel. And uh, I'm ashamed to say, I'm ashamed, I am very ashamed to say, look where Australia sits next to Korea. This is very embarrassing. You're 68 million tonnes and we are, uh, we are just a, a small 6.4 million tonnes. So I'm hoping that our football team will do better against Korea than this score here. This score is very embarrassing. Um, but also look at the scale of China and Japan, this enormous production. And the other thing to look at is how it's changed. When I was growing up, I thought I was growing up during a boring time. You know, I thought it was very boring. I was growing up in the 70s. And we thought in the West that the 60s were very exciting. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, we thought this is very exciting. And our time was boring. You are not living in boring time. You're living in exciting time. Because look at this. The world steel production has basically doubled in, uh, in, in less than 14 years, 13 years. Basically, the amount of steel in the world has doubled. Think about what that means in terms of all the infrastructure, all the, the money, all the expertise. Actually, when you look at the history of the world, it has a close connection to steel making. And we have here the amount of steel made in the world and we have here years and we have gross domestic product, which is the way economics people like to measure wealth. And what you see is, is that steel production and wealth are closely connected. So as the wealth of countries increase, they make more steel. This is good for Korea, but bad for Australia. <laughs> If this is true. Um, and what you also notice is that it's linked to big changes. So for a long time, the English ran the world. And when the English ran the world, around here, they made more steel than other people. Then the Americans, they became strong. They started building railways out to the west. They started building the Empire State Building. They started building huge uh, uh, infrastructure. And they ran the world. And then you see during this century, the industrialization of the eastern countries. And you see steel production go incredibly high as China has revolution, industrial revolution. So what message do we have here? Steel is closely linked to the development of the world. It's also closely linked to the political aspect of the world. Because when you look at it, what has happened in the 20th century? apart from some good music, some very bad hairstyles and various things along the way, the most interesting thing that happened is that the power, economic power of the world started to shift from the west to the east. All right? And we see that in steel. And we see that here in, 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 uh, in Pohang. We see exactly these things going on. Your university is an expression of that change. Bostec has become top university in the world, one of the best universities, in a really short period of time. And it's closely connected to these changes that we're talking about. So if your friends say to you, oh, you're very boring, you're working on steel, you should tell them about this. <laughs> steel making and steel production has a lot to do with the way the world is, is run. Why do we make so much steel? Maybe that's a stupid question to ask at Postec, but I will ask the question. <laughs> Why do we make so much steel? Well, it's not obvious, actually. When you first look at it, it's not completely obvious. Here we have strength, and here we have density. And when you look, steel is quite strong, but it's quite heavy compared to other metals. In fact, magnesium and aluminium are much lighter. So why are our cars not all made from aluminium and magnesium? Why do we make all our cars from steel? What's, what's going on? Would you like to offer an idea? Why do we make cars from steel if, if steel is quite heavy? Do you have any ideas? So it's cost, 
yeah? So it's to do with cost, yeah? Steel is a lot cheaper, correct? And if we look at this next graph, we see, oh, I should tell you something. This is the 13th university I've given this talk at, and that includes McGill, Toronto, University of Melbourne, and I'm comparing your answers to these students and keeping a scorecard. <laughs> so you need to keep this conscious. You need to wake up. So we look at here strength and cost. And look at this. Look at titanium. Titanium is something that very rich people have. Maybe a manager from the steel plant has titanium golf clubs or a sports car with a fancy titanium muffler. But not an academic. He doesn't have that much money. He'll have a steel car and steel golf clubs. So we see here the cost is incredible because this is log. That's log. So you're exactly right. Steel is much cheaper. All right. Steel is much cheaper. Why is it much cheaper? And the man, people from the steel company are not allowed to answer. Students have to answer. No professors. Why is steel? Uh, alumina, uh, alumina is very abundant in the Earth's crust. Titania is very, uh, very, very common. Easy to find those minerals, particularly in my country, actually. So, why is steel so... It's not abundancy. No. So, yes, yes, that's sensible. Keep going. More, more Korean logic here. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Uh, it's better to have an idea and not have an idea. Both these people have reasonable ideas, but can we keep going with it? You have another one? No, aluminium is very recyclable. No, they're good. You, you, you're, no, you're doing very well. You ask some good questions. They're exactly the right questions. There's nothing wrong about being wrong. It's having no idea that's worse than being wrong. What's an idea? Why? Thank you. Easy for reduction. All right. Can we take that back to something very basic? Come on, something very simple. If you had to explain to high, ch high school children, what does that mean? All right, I'll give you some other information. The oxide, the ores of aluminium are oxide. The ores of titania are oxide. The ores of iron are oxide. So what's going on? What does he, what, what's a simple way of expressing what he just said? Thank you. It's not as stable. You can even make it simpler. The bond between aluminium and oxygen is quite strong. The bond between iron and oxygen is not as strong. Now, it's more complicated than that, but that's the fundamental thing that's going on. One thing about steel, while we just talk about it, is steel is incredibly versatile. I'm amazed at how versatile steel is. Think about the steel requirements of, of having a beautiful uh, stainless steel uh, uh, washing machine compared to what you need for a pipe or what you need for a panel. The requirements for this are very different. It's very, it's very, steel has an amazing versatility. So not only is it cheap, it is a tremendously versatile. Now, how many, I'm, I'm intrigued, how many, how many grades of steel do you think POSCO make? Would you, could you have a guess, anybody? Do you have any idea? Th thousands or hundreds? It'd be hundreds, wouldn't it? It'd be at least hundreds, I'd say. Possibly thousands. So steel has tremendous versatility, as well as being cheap. But, as you correctly said, it has a lot to do with energy. And what we look at here is the energy to make the metal over the life cycle. And this is global warming. So these two things are connected. If you use a lot of energy, then you'll make the earth hotter, right? This is a simple thing. And we see here, look at this. This is titanium, crawl process. Look at this. Compared to steel, 15 times the energy. 15 times. Aluminium, magnesium, about 12, 11. Aluminium is about 20, 10 times that of steel. We have a joke in aluminium. We have a joke name for aluminium. We say it's congealed electricity. Can you translate that into Korean? What's um, condensed electricity? So aluminium is basically electricity put into a metal. And you can see this is extraordinarily big difference in energy. So simple thing is the bonds between the metal and oxygen 
great, greater stability and also affects the ability to make the metal through the energy you require. And it's a very large difference, very large indeed. Um, this is motivation to you. Let me show you something. The dominant process of making titanium is called the Kroll process. It's invented by a professor from Colorado. The dominant process for making magnesium is invented by a professor from University of Toronto. It's called the pigeon process. All right. I want to tell you that both these processes are quite stupid. Of all due respect to Professor Kroll and Professor Pigeon, they're not very good process. Very inefficient. Very inefficient indeed. So I would put to you, maybe some smart Korean person could come up with better process. So what's your surname? So, why can't we have the Kim process for titanium? Why not? Well, I can see no reason. I would expect actually some students from Postec can improve the situation. So, you can see that we need revolution here to even get close to steel. So, steel dominates for good reason. As you know, steel is made by a variety of processes. Uh, here at POSCO, uh, in this, you do a lot of this one, you get ore, probably from Australia. You get coal, you put it into a blast furnace, you then put it through steel making, ladle, continuous casting. If you go to other parts of the world, uh, this lady here is from Indonesia. In Indonesia, they get ore, they then turn it into direct reduced iron using natural gas, and then they put it to an electric arc furnace, then they put it through ladle, then they cast it. So there are about three variations of the way we make steel in the world. But most of the world's steel is made this way. Through the blast furnace, through the oxygen steel making, through the ladle and the continuous caster. And we are celebrating this process. This process is only, um, mass production of steel is only 150 years old. So before 150 years ago, the only way you could make steel was in little pots. And you could not make much steel at all. Then we learn to make it continuously by the, by the Bessemer process. And the Bessemer process dominated the early part of steel making. Then came the open half process. And then finally, the oxygen steel making process and the electric arc process took off since about 1950. And I'm going to explain to you how that happened. So the Bessemer process worked on the following way. You put liquid iron into a vessel. You blow air through the liquid iron, and over about 20 minutes, you made steel. So you could make steel very quickly by the Bessemer process, but it had some very significant disadvantages. Now, I want to see whether you can work this out. I'll give you a bit of information. They blew air through liquid iron. So what's in air? Nitrogen and oxygen. Can you see any problem? I mentioned that the quality of the steel was not good. Why? Why would that be? Why would there be a problem with blowing air through molten iron when you're making steel? What, how would it affect the quality? So air has oxygen and nitrogen. I'll give you more information. They learned how to kill the steel, get rid of the oxygen after the blow. They learned how to do that. What's the problem with blowing air through iron? Sorry? Yes, they knew how to do that. They learned how to do that. Yeah, they got over that problem. They knew how to get rid of the oxygen. Don't, don't look for something, don't look, for, don't look to be too clever. Just, just look for something obvious. You blow air through nitrogen. What about nitrogen and steel? What do you think about that? 
Well, yeah, yeah, all right, fair enough. Yeah, I, I go along. This gentleman suggested it's almost impossible to reduce nitrogen one to ten. Yeah, it's not impossible, but it's certainly very difficult. Yeah, but what does it do to steel nitrogen? Thank you. This gentleman's doing a good job for Postec. <laughs> He's keeping you guys afloat. You're doing all right against McGill and McMaster and Melbourne, all the rest of them. Yeah, you get brittle steel. Now you know when the Titanic. The Titanic is sailing along the ocean. It hits, a, it hits an iceberg and then splits. Brittle steel. When we get the steel from the bottom of the ocean, it's made from this process and it's not good steel. If you made the uh, Titanic <laughs> out of uh, POSCO steel, I would confidently predict that it would not sink so dramatically <laughs> because the steel would not be as brittle. If the steel was made by this process. So this process was quick but had quality problems. This process is the open half. The open half was an attempt to get around the quality problem. So what they did is they blew in natural gas at the top and they had liquid iron here and they let the oxygen diffuse into the iron through the slag and then the heat was recovered through some very complicated heat exchanges to help the process be efficient. Now open half steel making was for the people who are patient because it took about 12 hours to make steel. So in 12 hours, you can read a book, you can watch a film, you can form a relationship. You could even get married in 12 hours. It's a long time, right? 12 hours is a long time. This poor man has been with me for seven or eight hours. He's almost going slightly crazy. So 12 hours is a long time. Now, so it was high quality steel, but it was uh, very low productivity. Then we get to a classic dilemma of all metallurgical processes. That is the playoff between quality and productivity. That's still true. When we try to make the modern process go quicker, we often have problems of quality. If we slow the process down to make it high quality, we lose productivity. That's a, always a dilemma. And this is a dilemma in this process. So how did this happen? Now, I want to make professors feel good. This slide is about professors to make good. Because often people in industry say, oh, you professors, you're very clever, but you're not practical. That's very common. Well, let me tell you, oxygen steel making was invented by a professor. Hooray for professors. And we, uh, Professor Dewar at Zurich EDH, one of Europe's great universities, he came up with the idea of blowing oxygen into steel would overcome problems of the slowness of open half and get over the problem of the Bessemer process. And he tested in his university and then he, saw, he then took it to a company, Wilst Alpine, and they tested it in 1949 and fully commercialised in 1952. That's amazing. Five years from concept to commercialisation. So when you invent the Kim titanium process. This should be your goal. Concept to full industrial process, less than five years. They did it in 1948, so why can't we do it now, I say to you. So this is great breakthrough. Now I should explain to you, can anybody guess what, what there was something that happened before we could invent steel making that made this possible? And you, you'll notice here that this is 1948. So what do you think changed to make oxygen steel making possible? Have a guess. What do you think would have happened? What, what, what did it need? What was the breakthrough? So 1948, just after the Second World War. What happened in the Second World War? What did they invent in the Second World War? Rockets? Yeah? So what happened? Come on, have a think. Well, they started to make oxygen cheaply. Before that, oxygen was very expensive. So oxygen started to get made for all sorts of military applications. They learned how to make oxygen cheaply, which made oxygen still making possible. So the message from this is always keep an eye on what is going on. Don't, what is going on in the world around you? some possibility may come up. So this process was a fantastic success. It took half an hour, 20 minutes to make steel. 
uh, compared to 12 hours. Can you imagine how exciting everybody was that? And since it was invented, there have been three basic versions that have come into steel making. This is the classic one. This is the, you blow from the top with the lamps. And this is the one where you blow from the bottom. And this one is when you blow from both sides. So when you're very brave and courageous, you blow from both sides. All right? Now, I'm going to tell you something. This one is the one that dominates world production. This one is used a bit, but this one is the dominant process. And I'm going to give you some other information. This process here is quicker and closer to equilibrium. In other words, it's closer to the chemistry. This one is quite quick, but not as quick as this one. But this one dominates as the technology around the world. Why would that be? Why do you think blowing a lance from the top compared to blowing from the bottom would dominate? Any, any ideas? You don't need, this is not science, this is engineering, engineering thinking. Why would top process, this man's, he's already spoken too much, he must rest. Somebody else, why do you think blowing from the top would be, say again? All right, good question. The man said, is there a refractory problem? Well, this problem was solved. Actually, I know the man who solved it. I've met him personally. He's a very old man now. Mr. Lee, 94 years old. I saw him only a few months ago. Mr. Lee solved that problem by putting an outside annulus of gas. And this gas reacted with the oxygen and cooled the refractories about here and stopped the refractories being destroyed. So, no, they solved that problem. They found a solution to that problem. So you see how I keep saying to you about these people that invented these processes? The reason I'm doing that is because I'm trying to encourage you to do the same. To realize that these breakthroughs are done by human beings and teams of people. It's not anonymous, it's real people. I met the man who did that. I know him personally, the man that revolutionized that process. Lovely man, lovely guy, lovely fellow. But let's get back to the question. Why do you think the lance at the top is favoured around the world compared to blowing from the bottom. It's, not a, it's, 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 it's an engineering issue. It's not, a, it's not a scientific issue. Thank you. The force is strong here. There's good. There's a good engineer here. <laughs> ah, good engineering thinking. Yeah, it's simpler. It's easier. It's simpler to set up. It's easier to run. If something breaks, you just pull the lance out. It's simple. With this, it's, this, is, this is fairly complicated. This is a reasonably complicated thing. It does work very well, but this is less complicated. It's simpler. You don't need such a complicated system to be able to make it work. So yes, it's about maintenance and about simple ease of operation. That's another important principle to learn about metallurgy. Sometimes it's not the sophisticated process that works or succeeds. It's the one that is the easiest to operate. You should keep that in mind when you're working on your ideas because sometimes you have very elegant, beautiful idea, but unfortunately it's not very simple to do. Often simple process triumphs. So the process works in a very simple way. You put scrap in, you put hot metal, you blow, and then you tip. So it's very simple operation. You know, the operation is not very complicated, the basic process. Um, however, when you look at the details like I have done in my career, you find the thing is very complicated, very complicated indeed. And what you see is there's a lot happening. You have reactions occurring in the emulsion, you have reactions here where the bath is reacting, and you have flux dissolving, and you have refractories dissolving, and they're all happening at the same time, simultaneously. Now, does that sound like a simple problem? Because it doesn't sound simple to me. And I think my hair is going grey thinking about these problems. And I think that still making is the busy process. I call it the busy process. There is a lot happening in a very short period of time. So it makes it difficult to understand. To make things worse, it's extremely difficult to make a measurement. So I would never ask you to go inside the furnace, you know? It would not be nice there. You wouldn't last very long. So it's very, it's very hard to sample. It's hard to get data. So we have a, a complicated process under extreme conditions, making it very difficult. 
There's also many reactions occurring. Actually, this is just a short list. This is just a short list of the, of the reactions occurring. There's a reactions occurring in the emulsion between the slag and the impurities in the metal. And there are also reactions occurring in this area here. So there's many, many things occurring all at once. There is, however, a common idea about how decarburization occurs. So the main reaction is getting rid of carbon, which then leads to me to, to a question that you should answer very, very quickly. Why are we removing carbon from iron to make steel? Why, why are we doing that? Why do we decarburize iron? This will be easy. This should be, come on. <laughs> why are we taking the carbon out of the iron? It's a very simple question. These two people have already held up Postec. It's now your turn. Somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and what does that do to the, the, the metal? Does it make it uh, stronger, more brittle, more malleable? What does it do? Makes what? I love asking these questions. They're very simple questions, but get right to the point. Why do we, why do we remove uh, the carbon? Because carbon is a uh, carbon, but so uh, it uh, will make the, uh, the steel brittle. So we need to remove Thank it you. to the tire to make this, it tire. This gentleman is actually right. So carbon, in, in, in this, it's a complicated story, but carbon is essentially an embrittler. It's tough, hard material. If you remove the carbon, you get a malleable material. And what we do here is these curves show that decarburization builds up and then slows down. Now, there has been an interpretation for many years about why this happens. I am now providing a new alternative to explain that. And that's one of the reasons why I won this award. Not necessarily because people agree with me, but because they're interested in what I'm saying about this new approach, which I'm going to describe to you. The slag chemistry is also changing with time. Look at this very complicated story with the slag chemistry. And I would say at the moment there is no rigorous understanding of how this slag chemistry evolves with time. There is some understanding. We know some things, but we can't really predict the slag chemistry with time at the moment. And I, I hear you say, does that matter? Well, it does matter, because if you get it wrong, the following happens. If you get the chemistry wrong, you end up with what's called slopping, which is a, a nice word that basically means all the slag suddenly comes over the side. Actually, the best way of understanding slopping is get a milkshake, get a straw, and blow like mad, and then you'll see your drink go all over the floor. Now, imagine your drink is at 1600 degrees Celsius, then you understand what a problem that is. That's what slopping is. It's not good news, and nobody likes slopping. At the heart of the technology is this. This is the lance. And the lance provides what's called a Laval nozzle to provide the supersonic speeds. And this is the only practical way we can get supersonic speeds. And there you see the cavity there. And you see here the cavity going out that way. Um, I've done a lot of work in trying to understand how this flow behaves. So these supersonic, oh, the supersonic jet that is injected, the whole point of that is that you can create a lot of droplets. So it hits the surface of the metal and throws up droplets to react in the emulsion. That's the whole point of the supersonic speed. And when you look at it, we've been able to model how the jet behaves in different temperatures. And you can see that the hotter the temperature, which is the condition in steel making, the higher the jet speed is down the center. And we did this model, and then we were able to compare it to some data. And we could see here that this is data collected from the Japanese and they show the speed in the middle going along and decaying this way and we see our experiment, the experimental results compared to the data. Which raises a very important point. There's no point to having a model unless you have some data to validate. So if you're going to start a model, you better have some idea how you're going to prove this model, vice versa. So. Um, I couldn't hope to go through all the advances of oxygen steel making. It would take me, I'd be here for a week and you'd be very bored and, um, and uh, yeah, it would not be nice. But if you look at the advances, they're very significant. Advances in injection technology, advances in refractories. Re when they first started blowing, 
the refractories would only last 100 heats. Now they last up to 20,000 heats, which is truly unbelievable when you think of how extreme the conditions are. Um, there's been a lot of development of sensors, process control, and in modelling. And this is where, I suppose, this area here is where I tend to work in. And actually, this shopping list is the way that most technologies advance. If you look at most technologies, whether they be cars, whether they be washing machines, steel making, aluminium, you see, first of all, developments in the reactor, developments in the, in the basic layout. Then you see understanding of the process through better sensors, and you see developments of models. And then the models are used to optimize the process. So this is the way in which most technologies advance. And Professor Gann, he loves this. He's crazy about thermodynamics, and I tend to be crazy about this part here. But it's all important to understanding the process, to making sense of how the process works. Uh, the vessels have got a lot larger, and we see that the vessels with time, you can see some of them are up to 400 tonnes. Um, how big are the vessels in Pohang? Does anybody can them? How? 350. All right, they're pretty big. So at Pohang, they're 350, so, you know, near the world's largest vessels. So that means you can make 350 tonnes of steel in 20 minutes or 60? 50, my God, really quick. Is that the bottom blowing one? Only top. You do it in 15 minutes. That's, that's very quick. So you can turn around 350 tonnes of steel in 15 minutes, which is extraordinary. Um, some of the advances have been in how you process. The Japanese, in particular, have put a lot of emphasis on trying to optimise the amount of flux they put in the process, how much flux they put in to help remove the impurities. And they dephosphorize before they decarburize. This is some process that you see in Japan. And they also try to speed the process up by injecting the flux through the lamps and try and make the process go quicker. Now, this question, I don't want you to answer right now, but my challenge to the following students is this. Why would the Japanese, or anybody else, want to remove the phosphorus first before removing the carbon? That's my question to you. Now, uh, I should tell you that McGill and University of Melbourne and University of Queensland students got this question by the end of the session. So you have to protect the honour of Postec. <laughs> and the question is, why do, the, do people try to remove the phosphorus before they remove the carbon? And I want to give you a little bit of information to help you. First of all, an Allingham diagram would be very helpful in this debate. That's one piece of information. The second thing I want to tell you is that the process gets hotter. So when you start the process, it's reasonably maybe 1400. By the time you get to the end, it's 1650. So the process gets hotter. With those two bits of information, you can work out what's going on. So I give a challenge to a students from Postec to give an answer. No help from professors. That's cheating. No help. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of development in sensors. So, for example, people have developed systems for detecting the metal as it, and the slag as it's poured from the vessel to make it easier to stop the, the slag coming through. They've also come up with ways of detecting slopping. There are actually many ideas about this. Some people put uh, a vibration meters on the lance, but one idea I like is somebody just puts a camera a camera at the top of the furnace, and when they see the slag coming up, they have a detection from the, from the light meter. It's a very simple idea. So there's all sorts of sensors being developed for the process. Um, one of the things I really like is people who combine models with sensors. And we see that the Japanese are doing this at the moment. And what they do is they measure the gas, like a lot of people do. They measure the CO and CO2. They model the removal of silicon, manganese, and phosphorus. And then the one that they have difficulty modeling, which is FEO, they just do by mass balance. So what they're doing is they're combining a signal from the process, a mathematical model of the process, and then using that to predict the chemistry. Very simple and good idea. And this is combining uh, modeling, 
sensors and process information to, uh, to, to improve the process. So I like that idea very much. Um, while we're talking about radical ideas, I'm now about to tell you about a radical Australian idea. Because I have to do how Australians are clever. This is my job. So, um, if you probably noticed, if we go back to the steel making process, iron making is continuous, casting is continuous. Everything in between is batch process. Now, if you look at most processes, most processes are more efficient when they're continuous, right? So continuous processes are the dominant way to make processes more efficient. So why don't we make steel making continuous? Well, this man here, who was my mentor when I was a young guy, he, uh, he tried this. He built a 10-ton well, plant and he made steel continuously. He did it in the 60s. And he did it by having uh, a counter-current flow. Steel going this way, iron comes in, steel is made, and slag goes the other way. He used a counter-current flow of metal and slag to make, and if any of you have training in chemical engineering, you will know that counter-current is the clever way to react things, just like the blast furnace. And this worked, it actually worked. They made good steel this way. So if somebody tells you continuous steel making is impossible, that's not true. It has been done. It just hasn't been commercialized. But once again, maybe we should have the Kim process for continuous steel making developed at the Pohang. That would really revolutionize steel making if we could make steel continuously. So I give you this challenge to think about that. Is it possible? Could we do it? Could we make steel continuously? All right, so uh, I would summarize where we're up to of auction steel making at the moment as it's a dominant technology, but at the moment we still haven't optimized the following. We don't know how to balance flux addition, protecting the vessel, and the removal of silicon and phosphorus. We have difficulty, if you go all around the world and talk to steel plant people, they all have difficulty balancing these things and making sure they get it right. So I will go to POSCO tomorrow. I am very confident that I will hear some discussion around these issues. I, I'm sure there will be discussion. How do, we, how do we make sure that the vessel's protected but we don't put too much flux? How do we make sure the phosphorus is removed but we're not adding too much time, et cetera, et cetera? So these issues are very common issues. And another issue is how to make steel quickly without having excessive slopping or excessive foaming. And I think the reason why these problems are common is because not because steel makers are stupid or anything like that, but because we don't really have a dynamic model of the process. We don't have a fully dynamic model. So what that means is we're trying to optimize something where we don't have a rigorous description. So we're trying to make the car go faster, but we don't understand the exact details of the engine. We're trying to make the spaceship go to Mars, but we can't really know how to steer it exactly to the moon. We're trying to make things go faster and better without having a really good model. So I've been doing a lot of work in that area. Um, why do we model? Well, if we don't model, we end up just talking about things. We go, oh, look at that, look at this. Model allows you to think about what you're doing. It also helps you design experiments and think about what experiments you need to do. Think about the climate. When you are modeling the climate, you ask all sorts of questions about the, of the climate. And it makes you go and check things and make things work. Also, models help you develop your theory. And you can ultimately, once you develop models, use them for controlled and designing the, uh, the process. All right, so at my university, we have developed this, process, this model of oxygen steel making. And we have split the reactor into two zones. One zone where the jet hits the bath and there are reactions. You make droplets, the droplets go into the emulsion and then they return. You make slag here and the slag goes there. Along the way, we've had to develop models about the flux, the droplets, the gas, the decarburization, the scrap melting, 
the decarburization in the, in the bath zone. So all of those models took some poor PhD student at least six months to devise. So that list there is basically a list of several years work, a lot of work to try and get these models working. But basically it's a two zone model. And what we tried to do is strike a balance between empiricism and fundamental approach. Each submodel, each section of the model was proven and validated against data and then the models combined together. And I want to make something very clear to you. We didn't do any curve fitting. We developed the models and then we predicted the process. We didn't fit them together. You know that if you put K in front of every single equation, you can make everything fit, all right? Do you know that trick? <laughs> if you have five equations and you put K in front of them, K1, K2, K3, K4, K5, you can make anything. You can make, you can, you can make it look like a map of Korea you can make it look like the inflation rate. You can make it look like anything you want. That's called curve fitting. We didn't do curve fitting. We made the models and pushed the models together and see what we could predict. In the bath zone, we had to model both the decarburization by oxygen and the decarburization by carbon dioxide. These are two of the mechanisms that we know uh, affect the decarburization. And these equations were established in laboratories. And we also know at low concentrations that this equation governs the decarburization behavior. In the, um, in the emulsion, we had to develop new theory about how oxygen still making works. And I want to explain to you where that idea comes from. If you look at experimental data on oxygen still making, if you put a droplet of iron into a slag, the droplet doesn't just sink like you would predict. The droplet actually bloats because the gas from decarburization cannot escape. Actually, it's very similar to when you put an aspirin into water or and you see the bubbles raise the aspirin. And these droplets uh, cause this behavior means that the residence time of droplets is very high when you have a lot of carbon to get rid of. Now, I was actually present during these experiments. I was working at Carnegie Mellon when these experiments were occurring. And I remember these experiments. And a little bit later, I had a realization. Somebody asked me, they said, Jeff, you're good at mathematics. Can you predict how long a droplet should spend in the slag? So I did a, a force balance. Right? I think you all know this. Right? So we did a force balance on a droplet. And we found that the resonance time of droplets based on this force balance would be about 0.1 to 0.2 of a second. Now this was deeply shocking to me because I thought, how does oxygen still making work? How do the droplets spend enough time in the slag to react? How does that occur? when it's only 0.1, 0.2 of a second. It's then that I realized that what controls oxygen stillmaking is the bloating of droplets. The way oxygen stillmaking works is that when you blow at the start, the droplets have so much gas associated with them that they float. And because they float, they spend more time inside the vessel. At the end of the blow, they are dense. They don't have much gas, so they just sink. So the kinetics slow down. So let's go on to what that means. So this is the reinterpretation of oxygen stillmaking that I have developed with my co-workers. And what we say is, is that early on, you have a lot of carbon. And the residence time of the droplets may be 30, 40, 50 seconds. Then as the blow continues, the droplets become dense. They don't spend so much time in the emulsion. So therefore, the, the whole reaction slows down. This reinterpretation of stillmaking is called the bloated droplet theory. Now, if you're just wondering whether it's my crazy idea, there are also two or three steel companies who use this idea now to model their stillmaking, and also a couple of universities working on it. So this is basically saying that stillmaking needs to be understood that when you make the droplets early on, they float. Later on, they sink. 
And this is very important to understand how still making works. When we, inter when we put this all together, we then come up with this graph. Now I wish to say something. I may have made mistakes. I may be wrong. I may have made errors. I acknowledge that. However, this is the first graph ever in the history of steelmaking that attempts to understand how much reaction occurs in the emulsion and how much occurs where the jet hits the bath. So whatever errors I've made, at least I've come up with some estimate or some reasonable estimate of what's going on. And what we see here is, is that early on the decarburization of the emulsion gets high and then it dies off as the droplets become dense. Then in the impact area it stays relatively constant and this provides this curve. Now when we combine all these calculations together and we compare it to plant data we get curves like this. So this is the uh, result from the plant and this is the result from our model. And let me be, explain what we're doing here. This, this takes everything into account. This is the position of the lance. This is the amount of scrap. This is the amount of flux. And we've done this for quite a few different plant situations. And we get typically results like this. So in other words, we get the basic decarburization curve right. Let me tell you one of the weaknesses of it. I've just been telling you about its good points. <laughs> the weakness of it is we're not very good at predicting the end point. So we don't get the end point very well. We get the basic curve very well, but the end point is not so good. And I think that has to do with the mathematics of our model, which I would not bore you by describing to you, but I think we can improve that. So of course, this caused some excitement when I presented these results about two or three years ago. And a number of steel companies are now working with me on using this model to understand their process and developing the model further along. Um, when you have a model, you can play uh, thought games. You know, you can play thought experiments. So I went, oh, well, what would happen if you made the droplets very small? What would happen? What would happen if you made drop really tiny droplets? And this shows you the impact of the different droplet size on the decarburization. So that's one of the other benefits of having a model. You can start um, playing thought games. Like, what happens if we blow out faster this way? What happens if we make the lance go deeper? What happens if we add more flux? Etc, etc. You can start playing thought games. And along the way we've learnt lots of things about scrap, slag formation and hot metal. Can I tell you the bit that I'm most unconfident about? Is this one here. Making sense of the slag. And how the slag is generated is a current topic of a current study we're doing at Swinburne because we don't feel confident about that part of the process. So we feel confident about this, we feel confident about this, but we don't feel so confident about that part of the process. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're trying to improve our understanding of splashing because uh, that's central to the process. Um, actually, uh, I need to tell you something. You should do, all grad students should do this. About 10 years ago, I did a lot of work on splashing. And I established a mathematical model for splashing, which is called the blowing number. And quite a few companies use it. My PhD student, uh, Shaban Sabah from Bangladesh, was working on it for six months. And she came into my office and said, your model is wrong. <laughs> I said, what? She said, it's wrong. <laughs> And then she explained to me, and she's right, it is wrong. <laughs> uh, that's what every good PhD student should be aiming to do. You should not be trying to prove your professor right. You should be trying to uh, show where he's wrong. And she has shown that model I produce is good for one regime, but not good for another regime. And we've been exploring that. So splashing work is underway. Um, dynamic model of slag generation, that is also underway at my university. And we want to link all of this together with slopping, to predict slopping. And that also is underway. And of course, we want to validate this over a wide range of conditions. And today, I had a lovely question asked of me just before the meeting. This gentleman said to me, oh, what about modeling bottoms blown still making? <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't know much about that. <laughs> so I've been modeling top blowing still making, 
But of course, bottom blown still making also is worthy of uh, modeling and making sense of. That's another whole series of problems that should be interesting. And if we get on top of this, we can stop all this modeling and get on to improve control and optimization, which is the ultimate goal of all this work, right? We're not doing this, well, partly we're doing this work to keep me employed. That's important. I need to be paid. My family needs to eat. But with that problem aside, we're also trying to optimize the process, to make the process work better. So, my conclusion is that uh, there is an incredible growth in steel production. That is very exciting. Um, there is development in dynamic models. I've only talked about my work and some work going on at JFE, but there's also good work going on at other places in the world. And I think that's exciting. So lots of groups are working together. Um, we have a lot more data than we used to. There's a lot more data available now about auction still making. Unfortunately, not such good data for bottom line still making, I have to acknowledge. Um, and I think, I love still making, but if we put still making aside for one moment, and think about it. We're talking about splashing, foaming, emulsions, droplets. These are all very interesting, you know, physics. The physics of this is very interesting. Um, I would want to say to any of you, if you want to give yourself a really interesting problem, get your milkshake in a clear glass. Blow in and make a foam. And study that foam. Look at that foam. And try and understand how that foam works. It's extremely interesting. You don't have to like steel making to enjoy looking at a foam. All foams are fascinating. And if you understand how the milkshake works, can you explain to me? Because then that will help me understand steel making. I need your help. Um, today, I have been talking about some work that I've done with a lot of my co-workers. And I've been making it sound like all this work is my own. This is not true. I have many good postgrad students whose job is to make me look clever. You understand this is the job of a postgrad student. <laughs> First of all, to make the professor look clever, then make themselves look clever. You need to get the right sequence, you know. <laughs> so I am very grateful for all my co-workers. I would also like to say something nice about the ASIT. They give money so that we can go around the world and talk to people and meet people and try to understand uh, each other's work better. So I think this is very good. They're a good organization. I think it's very cheap to join. They, you can get their magazine for $20 a year or something like that. It's very cheap for students. It's a, it's a good deal. So I thank the ASIT. And I am extremely grateful for your patience and my good humor. And I, um, I look forward to hearing your answer to the problem about phosphorus. Thank you.